Hello, comrades, and welcome back to Marxist Voice, the podcast of the communist. And we're now on to episode seven of the Towards the Revolutionary Communist Party series. There's only two weeks to go until the founding Congress. And with students across Britain heading back to campuses uh, this week and, and next week, we're going to be focusing in this episode on the question of organizing on campuses, how RCP branches can reach out to students, recruit them, organize them, and crucially as well, turn out towards the wider class struggle. Uh, so as always, I'm your host, Jack Ty Wilson, and today we're joined by Fiona Lally, who's a member of the executive committee of the soon-to-be RCP and a member of the campaigns department, as well as Lubna Bardi, who's also a member of the campaigns department as well. How's it going, guys? Hiya. Hiya. Yeah, not <laughs> bad. You've been up to much this week. How's it going preparing for the Congress? Yeah, well, as you said, we're only a couple of weeks out now, so all roads lead to Congress. Uh, main things we've been focusing on are just the political preparation for that, making sure everyone's discussed all the documents um, and thinking about how they want to contribute um, to bring their recent experience in the branches uh, to the whole party. Mm -hmm. And how about you, Lubna? Yeah, same. Uh, there's a great buzz going around the organization. Uh, I just had a phone call as well today with a comrade from Brighton. They have a great launch event for the RCP prepared for this uh, weekend. I have been postering around town and, you know, flyering for it. So, yeah, so it's all looking really up. Good. Sounds great. Sounds great. Um, so, yeah, let's just jump straight into things then. The first thing I want to ask to sort of lay, uh, yeah, to set the scene, uh, so to speak, is what is the situation facing young people and in particular students today? Uh, either of you want to go first? Yeah, um, I mean, obviously we know that young people have uh, only experienced a crisis basically in their lifetime. Um, they have seen obviously like the, the, the war going on at the moment in, in Palestine, but there are also all sorts of other issues on their minds. You know, like how uh, what the job prospects even looks like with the with the current deep crisis in Britain, um, to the housing crisis, right? Um, to the climate crisis. There's like basically crisis mm -hmm. on every of every front. Uh, so obviously their their future is now very uncertain, and especially you know how how does that look like you know for future generations is all very unclear at the moment, um, and we have seen you know the eruptions of of mass movements across uh, across the world and and in Britain as well you know around the climate uh, around racism right with the uh, say Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. um, all sorts of yeah big uh, uh, big eruptions essentially of of anger uh, in Britain um, and yeah we can we can see that in. in in every aspect and of course in education as well right like literally schools are crumbling as, as mm. we know with, with all of the um you know terrible underfunding of, of education and now with the universities like there are massive layoffs announced in various places um you know like norwich uh, and goldsmiths also announced 130 compulsory redundancies wow. as well uh department closures in in sheffield and others uh, places there are even now talk about basically merging uh universities uh to basically keep them afloat right mm -hmm. um so this is this is like all a backdrop for for a huge uh yeah um all of the sort of you know certainty that we had in the past is all just taken away mm -hmm. um so of course people are going to question uh, the system basically mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah it seems like uh yeah the lives that students have these days is, is, is no life at all you're saddled with debt for for the rest of your life basically to face a declining quality of education with the staff that are burned out and, and depressed and on top of that, you also have the student housing crisis as well, which is reaching yeah, yeah. unparalleled uh, proportions. There's uh, a shortage of hundreds of thousands of beds forcing students to go into the private rental yeah. sector, dodgy landlords, mold, all of this sort of stuff, mm. often having to commute more than an hour to get to their universities and so on. And yeah, there seems to be no real solution to this. The universities yeah. are facing a funding crisis, uh, all of these different things. Um, so yeah, it's no surprise really that a lot of people are turning towards uh, radical, uh, looking for, for radical alternatives uh, like mm -hmm. communism. Uh, yeah, Fiona, is there anything you'd like to add? Yeah, actually, you know, based on what you just said, it made me think, you know, there's so much going on in the world today, big fundamental, almost existential mm -hmm. threats to mm -hmm. life, to humanity, to society and questions of war, things that maybe in the past, at least for young people in, in this country, in Britain, felt like a far off abstract thing that maybe they read about um, in, in history um, or, you know, saw in movies or something like this. But now is becoming a much more real 
uh, issue in their lives. One, because wars cause inflation, they cause a lot of direct impact at home. But not only do you have these huge geopolitical um, crises unfolding, then in their literal day-to-day -day lives when they're going to universities, mm. they're also seeing smaller degrees of this same problem, like uh, this massive underfunding that's causing mergers in universities, the stuff that Lubna was just talking about. And basically what I'm kind of drive at is that at every single plane of people's mm. lives, they're, they're seeing political crisis and economic crisis. And, and that has an impact on consciousness. Mm. Um, and, and there's no one out there offering any kind of you know, solution. I mean, in the past, you had people like Jeremy Corbyn, mm -hmm. um, who were a bit of a reference point. But that Jeremy Corbyn hasn't been the leader of the Labour Party for a number of years now, and isn't a reference point for 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds mm -hmm. going to university at this point. So actually, what we're finding when we're on campus is that the young people meeting us today are already saying, yes, I'm a communist. They're already saying there is something deeply wrong with capitalism and, and they want to they wanna know what, what our solution is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I think that brings us quite nicely then to the next question that I'd like to ask. Uh, yeah, which is with all that in mind, what has our organization, uh, the soon-to-be revolutionary communist party, I'm sick of saying soon-to-be, I can't <laughs> wait until it just becomes the revolutionary communist party. What have we been doing in the past period uh, to connect with uh, young people on university campuses? Yeah, so just going off of that, I mean, the Marxist Student Federation has existed for a, at least 10 years now, I want to say, um, which we set up um, in order to meet the young people out there in society that we thought already did have an interest in, in Marxist ideas. And, you know, in our organization, in our in our party, it's very important that we win people over on the basis of the ideas themselves. And so we have always placed a massive emphasis on putting on high quality um, theoretical discussions, going over the basics, the fundamentals of Marxism, um, from historical materialism to philosophy to economics, as well as, well as analyzing current events and, and, you know, past revolutions, for example. Um, and, and the Marxist Student Federation has built itself up over a number of years precisely through this. I think when we started, we had maybe, I want to say three. ten. Three? I was going to say three, ten. Yeah. <laughs> okay, a, a handful. Three. Okay, yeah. there you go. I'm exaggerating. We had a handful of societies. Um, and now we've got a presence at over 50, well, around 50 mm -hmm. campuses across the UK. And we've only been able to, to build that through um, uh, paying attention to, to Marxist theory. Because when people are questioning the system, um, they want serious answers that strike right to the heart of, of the matter. And that is what our experience over 10 years has shown us. And in that time, we've also learned how to apply those ideas to um, the real events that are taking place in society. 10 years ago, there weren't as many events. There weren't as many wars unfolding, for example, or even revolutions. There have been revolutions over the last couple of years across the world in places like Sudan, for example. Um, and so now I would just say it's it's easier for us to connect Marxist theory with what's unfolding around us because you can point to so many different crises unfolding all across the, the world. Um, and, and the other thing that that's given us is a real solid defense of Marxism in what we would describe as an alien milieu mm -hmm. in that the and what do we mean by that the universities are mean extraterrestrials <laughs> <laughs> the universities are a, are a hotbed um for alien class ideas and these are ideas that that, that, that actually reflect bourgeois thought and, and bourgeois pessimism because capitalism is in a period of decline um that's kind of wrapped up and masked in, in left language and, and this is kind of how we see postmodernism, mm. which is really concentrated in the university field and so the marxist societies are, are our first line of, of defense um against that and in time to trying to educate the people most interested in, in revolutionary ideas and a revolutionary way to change society in, okay, well, what is the philosophy that you need in order to actually do that? Because you're not going to get it from the from the universities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is there anything yeah. you'd like to add to that, Lubna? Yeah, no, I, I, I think that last point is, uh, is very important. I mean, we have always sort of say proudly stood firm on, on the theory of Marxism. That's, that's sort of like our... Uh, 
I, I don't know how to say it, but basically, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, how we have, you know, built from scratch, basically. Um, but that is also what sharpens us up, right? Is to, to always be able, you know, in a friendly way, just like, you know, have these conversations about the fundamentals because they are precisely what distinguishes us from anything else. Um, and, you know, when, when you want to intervene, you know, in, in actually changing society, you do have to have a good understanding of where all of these questions come from. Because often, you know, students would come to us, you know, angry about the world, right? But angry also about specific questions, whether it's like women's oppression or, or the climate question or, or racism. Um, and of course, from academia, the, there is often the, the, you know, the idea, say, of identity politics or, yeah, mm -hmm. postmodernism and, you know, things like that. Um, so we do have to engage in that discussion. Um, and that in turn, you know, say builds up, you know, our, our members as well in understanding how to, you know, connect our ideas, our program to actually, you know, taking part actively, you know, in the fight against, uh, against oppression and all of these issues, which of course, fundamentally it's a class question, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what we bring out um, in all of our meetings, in all of our discussions, um, which is often, you know, some blurred over, you know, by academia. Mm -hmm. um, and we put that basically at the forefront of, of everything really. Um, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, I think that leads us on quite nicely to a question that we've had uh, in from a listener uh, to the podcast. And just before we get into that, just a reminder to all of our listeners at home that if you have a question or a report or anything you'd like to say uh, and, and have us respond to you on this podcast series, then please feel free to send those in at uh, communist.red forward slash right. We'd love to hear from you. And um, yeah, we've actually got a few questions uh, to, to respond to on this episode, but we'll start with one uh, from a comrade in East London. So I'll just play that now. Hello comrades, my name is Ben from the Whitechapel branch and I'm a student at Queen Mary University. We've had a lot of engagement on campus with our paper sales and stalls where people who already have an understanding of communism come up and have discussions with us. And some people, although it may be few, who come to us and try and learn about what communism is. I feel like there's a lot of untapped potential though in people who might not understand what communism really is. So what type of topics and discussions can we have in branch to engage the issues that a lot of young people are having nowadays? Thanks very much for sending that question in, Ben. Uh, so yeah, what do you guys think? What kind of topics can we have, not just in our RCP branch meetings, but also publicly as the, the Marxist societies and the communist societies to, to attract young people, to explain to them our perspectives, our ideas, uh, and so on? What do you think? Well, I mean, it's a good question. This is, of course, something that often gets asked and, and raised. I mean, first of all, it's a, it's a very concrete thing, right? You, you do have to think about um, what would sort of engage people uh, the best way, you know, at, uh, at your campus. Um, of course, keep an eye on the ground, like an ear to the ground to basically what is of interest, you know, to the people around you, also people who attend your meetings quite regularly and might ask, you know, to, to know more about a particular topic. Um, so it, it is very, yeah, very a concrete question, but, and we have to stay flexible, right? I mean, I know in, in some places they have put on meetings on, on the climate or British perspectives or, or yeah about whatever is sort of relevant for example if there are like you know um, say you know layoffs as we mentioned mm -hmm. before at your university then maybe you, you can organize something around that right and, and discuss why the university is, is uh, heading towards bankruptcy or, or issues like this and link it basically to the overall crisis of, uh, of British capitalism um, but yeah the, the point is is that the content of our meetings whatever question you discuss whether it is as we mentioned you know the climate or, or university or, or any of these uh, issues it's not just to analyze them right like we're not academics we're not just you know sitting around and and saying yes that's a problem because of this and that reason and then go home you know like yeah. the point is is that we go into depth about how this actually links you know uh, fundamentally to the system 
And therefore, what is the best way to connect our ideas and our program and that understanding, you know, to, to, you know, the wider student layer, but also, for example, to the staff, right? If it's, for example, about the layoffs or anything like that. And therefore, how can we actually organize ourselves to, to change that, right? Mm -hmm. To take part in, in the class struggle. That's what it means also to be a communist, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's, that's like you, if you are gonna, you know, leave university ground, you're still a communist, right? Mm -hmm. You are participating in that struggle. So you come together to organize and to think about what way forward, right? And you're trying to bring more and more people into that. So you do have mm -hmm. to keep an eye out to what they would find interesting and what also radicalizes people around you, uh, yeah, to talk about. Um, I mean, I can. Uh, there is also a really interesting report actually from from Lancaster, um, and they mentioned that they had a bit of a say a lull, you know, a, mo a moment mm -hmm. of like not getting much uh, attraction. But one of the fundamental points as well is it's not just the, the topic alone. You obviously have to build for it, right? And mm -hmm. and Lancaster did it in a very dynamic way, like going into their lectures and doing a lecture shout out. I think they did a meeting about the climate and about women and, you know, things like that. And they just, you know, stood at the lecture, did a whole speech about why this is such an important topic and why they should come to the meeting to discuss this. Um, they also did speeches like on campus ground about, you know, you know, sort of like getting that engagement about the topic and talking to people about it and bringing them to the meeting. Um, and this result is in a few people basically joining the branch because of that. Mm -hmm. And and it's yeah, so it's it's not just about the topic alone. You have to be an active, dynamic uh, branch as well to really get people engaged with uh, what you have to say, basically, mm -hmm. and get them excited to come to the meeting and discuss further with you. So yeah. Yeah. Anything you'd like to add, Fiona? Yeah, I think this is an important point because there's so much in society that we could analyze from a Marxist perspective mm -hmm. um, and have a really nice, interesting discussion about. Um, I'm trying to think of an example, maybe like your favorite TV show or your favorite <laughs> film, um, of which we could have lots of good chats, Marxist analysis, Breaking Bad or something like this. I'm sure they're out there and I'm sure they're very interesting, but that's not really going to aid us in our task of building a revolutionary organization that can fight to change the world. That doesn't mean we've got nothing to say about questions on art and culture. Mm -hmm. Actually, we do have a lot to say um, and, and, and have had meetings on these topics in general from a, from a general point of view. Um, um, but niche specific interest is not what we want to focus our Marx Society or Communist Society meetings on. And, and this is also linked to what Lubna just said about how we then build for those meetings, right? Which is that we run recruitment stalls on campus. We go door knocking, we do lecture shout outs. And when we meet people, we say, are you interested in Marxist ideas? Are you interested in understanding the state? And then we've got to connect that with something real in life um, or a mm -hmm. real event that has taken place. For example, recently, when um, George Galloway won the uh, the election in Rochdale, and quickly after that, Rishi Sunak felt the need to come out on this stadium, not stadium, on a podium, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a stadium, but he wouldn't get that many yeah, people there. It, it, stadium, yeah. <laughs> it was just a podium of, uh, you know, press people, journalists. Yeah. So he stood outside number 10 and, you know, made a big speech about the threats to democracy. And all of this was because someone won an election that they didn't want to win. Um, through completely democratic measures, but it was something that they didn't really like. And that reflects something to do with the state, actually, um, and also democratic rights today under capitalism. Mm -hmm. Now, Marxists have a very clear idea about the role of the state, how it arises, how it is wielded by the capitalists. Um, but we also understand there can be splits um, even within the state in different moments. All of this stuff is is relevant and, and questions about George Galloway Rochdale are likely to be on people's minds. So our job is to connect with that and show how um, the weapon, show what the weapon of Marxist theory gives us, which is understanding a way to navigate the class struggle um, and educate our own members as a result. But I think that the way we we build for these meetings and then the ideas within them are, are, are two very important aspects of, of what it means to do RCP work on campus, I would mm -hmm. say. And also just to say, like we've noticed, as we said, like more and more people are radicalized. So mm -hmm. it also 
now is the time to really proudly and boldly proclaim yourself. Oh my God, proclaim yourselves <laughs> as the communists on campus and and get that. Like we get so much uh, like response and people uh, coming to us, just wanting to ask about it, wanting to to get to know us basically. Mm-hmm. And that has definitely increased, I would say, over the couple of years, uh, mm-hmm. you know, that we've done this work. So uh, we are basically, for that reason, are just bolder than we've ever been mm-hmm. before because we, we see that there is so much interest and so much to gain now um, about, you know, just being real, like an, an active communist, you know, fighting organization yeah. on campus, basically. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Now, all of what you've been saying there is, uh, yeah, is very good. And I think it really highlights that Marxist theory isn't something uh, abstract or lifeless or something that we talk about just out of historical curiosity or to sound clever or something like that. There are so many events going on around us. Uh, and I guarantee that for every single event that takes place, someone like Lenin or someone like Marx or Engels has written something which deals with the very essence of this uh, question. Yeah. I'm thinking in particular, one of the branches that I follow up uh, is uh, in, uh, in, in the Northwest is considering um, putting on a meeting about the events with Iran and, and Israel and the Middle East and so on. Yeah. And as part of the political preparation for that, uh, we're discussing uh, Lenin's writings on war. Uh, mm. There's this pamphlet called uh, Socialism and War. And it really gets to the heart of the matter, the nature of imperialist war, why wars are happening under, under capitalism. And most importantly, the communist way forward, what kind of pro- program communists should have uh, when faced with these questions? Should we adopt uh, pacifist phrases like, oh, you know, we need to have international diplomacy and all that sort of stuff? Or do we point out the need for, for revolutionary class uh, struggle? Mm. So, yeah, and, and I think as well as that, uh, obviously, yeah, current events are something that should be used as, as a hook for a lot of these meetings. But at the same time, a lot of young people are interested in learning about things like the Russian Revolution, yeah. what Lenin really stood for. And yeah, of course, we are running the, the Year of Lenin campaign right now. We've got, you know, in defense of Lenin, the book out right now. We've got, you know, magazines, pamphlets and so on, which deal with various uh, aspects of Lenin's life and ideas. Mm-hmm. So these are all things that we could be using to prepare for, for these meetings and, and topics that we could be discussing uh, as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, anything else on this question or should we move on to the next one from Leah in Lancaster? Hi, I'm Leah from the Lancaster District. Recently, there have been occupations in universities across the country with demands relating to housing or Palestine. How can we intervene in these sorts of campaigns? And should we even start our own? Thanks very much for sending that in, Leah. And uh, yeah, what are your guys' thoughts? Yeah, this is a very good question. Um, And as Leah pointed out, occupations have been happening um, quite a lot, actually, in the last uh, couple of weeks, six weeks, uh, two months, particularly over the question of Palestine. Now, Occupations, I mean, we've been involved in many occupations over the years, some very big and some, to be honest, quite small, um, over various different issues that cropped up on campuses. And, you know, occupations are an important tactic. They play a certain role in in the movement and in student movement in particular, and they have done historically uh, as a way for students to try and force, you know, university management to, you know, come to the negotiating table um, or to, you know, raise certain demands. Because as is pointed out, I think we'll we'll cover a little bit later on in the podcast, students, you know, aren't the exact same as workers in terms of the role that they can play in halting production. They can't halt production um, by themselves as, as students. And therefore, for us, the goal of any occupation that students start should be also to involve the workers in the university and to bring students and staff together um, and, and raise demands that broadens that occupation outward. Um, I think this is very important because unfortunately it is the case that in a lot of student occupations there can be quite an inward looking approach from some of the people involved in it and this comes from initially the desire to keep the occupation to people who they know they can trust and to keep things going and unfortunately what that results in is an occupation for the sake of an occupation rather than being connected to very clear demands. What we're interested in when looking at an occupation, deciding, you know, if we're going to get involved in the role we're going to play is what are the demands of this occupation and and how can we broaden it out and make it wider? I would say not even just to the other staff in that university, but beyond the campus itself um, and looking to workers in the town that that university is in. Very 
very often the problems, the conditions that either students or staff in that university are facing are problems or conditions that are shared by other workers. And if you widen it out, then you're much more likely to, to run an effective campaign. Um, and, and, and so what we've got to look at is what does this yeah, politically represent? But of course, we, we support occupations and we have been involved in, in, in many of them uh, over the years. But we're, we're very interested in specifically what is that occupation for? Because unfortunately, um, in some places, it, it kind of becomes quite an amorphous um, bubble, actually, mm -hmm. of niche particular interests. And then the discussions that are held inside those occupations are not related to the struggle itself. I think mm -hmm. that's a mistake. Um, and, and the way to have a successful occupation is to do so with clear, ultimately bold socialist demands, which are the sort of demands that we would raise and, and put forward. Mm -hmm. Can you give any examples that would relate to yeah, university finances or Palestine or housing or anything like that? Yeah, what kind of demands would be raised? In a lot of university occupations that we have been a part of, um, we want to raise the, the issue of free education, which is one that concerns students. Um, but this also links to the question of, of staff because it's related to um, one, how the university is run in particular, but also wider questions in society. For example, one demand that is important for students to raise is to open the books. As was mentioned at the start, in a lot of universities now, you're having departments that are being shut down, specific courses that are being taken away or shut, uh, staff members who are being made redundant, a whole host of things. And they're doing this on the grounds that um, they have to make cuts and that they can't afford things. Or, for example, you know, they're raising the price of student accommodation and, and various different things. And so we say, OK, we'll open the books. And, and prove it to us and often or if, if you're able to then look at the books probably what you'll find is that they're spending a lot of money on vice chancellors salaries huge vanity projects where they're building um just yeah big kind of strange buildings <laughs> um and what else do they private do private contractors as well private yeah. contractors all of this um and so opening the books is a is an important demand to to raise in that context but not just that, another demand that we raise ultimately is for um, student and staff control over the university itself, uh, democratically run, right? A point that we often make is that who has the best interests of the students and the staff? Um, and more so beyond that, who knows how to make the university better? It's not the management who sit far removed from the actual conditions of, of students in terms of how they're learning and what they're learning, or the staff whose job it is, is to try and create a, a good environment for students to learn and then actually do that teaching and do that communicating. Um, the student and staff know best how that university should be run. So that's another important demand that, that we would raise. Um, for example, uh, during the COVID pandemic, there was a lot of there was a lot in the student movement. There was rent strikes that cropped up that we were very active in, mm -hmm. and that was a really clear example of how the students and staff knew best what should be put into place in order to make COVID teaching possible or safe. Um, if students were going to be on campus, for example, but you had a lot of examples of management or private student housing companies rushing crazy decisions trying to force students back into campus mm. just to trap them in in student accommodation because they couldn't actually they were they were you know there was this idea that there would be blended learning and then in a, in a couple of mm -hmm. places the students arrived and found out there wasn't going to be any blended learning in terms of online and in person um and so we raised a lot of demands around that time about student staff control mm -hmm. over the universities themselves yeah thanks for explaining that fiona is there anything you'd like to add to that Libna? yeah i mean um I think actually what we spoke about before, you know, like uh, basically the, the importance of theory and how you said like everything that we've been through basically or what we're witnessing has already been sort of like, you know, the tools have already been provided by uh, Lenin and Trotsky and all of that. Well, I would say like it actually also applies even on a small scale, right? Even on the in the sense of like occupations, like oh, this is not a new thing. Um, occupations, as we have said, happened for decades, like at, at British universities. And we do have to not go 
you know, the students activists, they often just look at today, right? At, at the now and mm. just go into it because yeah, it's a, it's a method, it's a known method, um, you know, to, to basically use. Um, but we, we do have to think about it a little bit more tactically, basically, like what is actually the best way of organizing an occupation that has the highest chance of getting your demands, you know, met basically. And we just know, like, from just looking at, at successful occupations that, in most cases, they are won by broadening them out and winning them over on the best demands that connect not just to the students, as we said, but to staff as well. And not just in one particular university, which, of course, is a great way to start, but across the country, right? Because that would be such an immense blow, you know, to, mm -hmm. to the government as well to, to listen to. Which, of course, is the benefit of like, you know, sort of being part of an organization like ours. It's, it's the fact that you can raise your sights, right, on, on those mm. like, you know. Um, on the bigger picture. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's precisely what we have to offer, right? Like if we go into new occupation, of course, we're there to support it and, and, and to help or whatever. But also there to precisely raise the sides, to precisely speak about, mm -hmm. you know, the importance of the correct demands of the politics, because all of that, all, all of these tactics flow from politics. If your politics is a bit, say, well, say limited mm -hmm. and, and you're looking at, you know, single issue sort of questions, then obviously you are going to tend to be a bit more inward looking mm -hmm. or not really seeing the potential that is out there. Mm -hmm. and, and we're precisely, you know, saying, no, there is a lot of potential and it's a matter of building for it and mm -hmm. connecting, you know, uh, your program the best way possible with the wider yeah. student layer and staff and everything. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's that's what we do basically. Yeah, I think yeah. that's a really, really good point. Mm. And all of this actually reminds me um, of a text written by Leon Trotsky, I think back in the 1930s possibly, uh, which is very, very useful, I think, in, in terms of uh, understanding how communists should connect a Marxist program with the real living, often partial struggles, you know, often they are around a, mm -hmm. you know, a single issue or a few issues, mm -hmm. how to connect that program with the real living struggle. Yeah. And that is a text called the Transitional Program, uh, which mm -hmm. I think all uh, comrades uh, and communists should read. Uh, it's very, very insightful. Uh, and yeah, if you want to get your hands on a copy of that, uh, we do sell it in the, on the Well Read Books um, bookstore as part of our anthology called The Classics of Marxism, Volume 1. Uh, yeah, so you can find a link to that in the show notes of this podcast. Yeah. And yeah, I think we'll move on um, to our next and final question to round things off, which is from Alex uh, in Lancaster. Uh, once again, we've got a Lancaster double billing <laughs> today. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I'll play that now. Hi, comrades. It's Alex from the Lancaster District of the Revolutionary Communist Party. Historically, students have acted as a barometer for the mood in society. I mean, just a couple of years ago, they were leading the initial charge of many of the climate strikes when students were demanding for system change, not climate change. But students are obviously not going to be able to change the world by themselves. So the question is, what can the Revolutionary Communist Party do to reach the workers on and off campuses? Well, yeah, thanks very much for sending that in, Alex. Um, yeah, who wants to go first on that question? It's a very good question, I would say. Of, yeah, as we said, like, we are more than just a student society, right? Like, we, we are a party where, you know, as we said, soon to be revolutionary communist party. Um, so if you were to join us, we're basically training you up and immediately turning you towards the class struggle, right? Um, of course, as a student, you have sort of the luxury of time, so you can spend, uh, you know, a lot of the time, you know, coming together and discussing these ideas, learning from history, understanding the theory. But of course, precisely for the reason, not as, as I said, not an academic purpose, but precisely to prepare yourself for intervening in, in the class struggle. Um, and that is therefore for life. If you leave university, you're going to end up, you know, at a workplace somewhere um, and you will have to carry those politics with you. Right. And, uh, and and see if you can build, you know, a branch or a cell at your workplace or, um, you know, sell the paper to your colleagues and talk about, you know, what's going on. You're not you're not, you know, not a communist anymore. You're precisely a communist for life. Um, and I think like one of the things is, is that if you are, for example, a student and, uh, and your branch is involved with this or that, like say trade union question, then you're learning already so much, say as a student about this, like 
just to, I mean, Fiona can uh, can elaborate more on that. But for example, like our students say in Swansea and Cardiff have been really active with the uh, Port Talbot, you know, closure, um, which I, I believe we've spoken, you know, before about. But that is uh, that is of course an immense learning curve, you know, to go through. Uh, like our students have basically just gone to Port Talbot, do, did some door knockings, you know, spoken to the steel workers about this closure, and. It is like, you know, very important for them to to really listen and, and to understand the conditions, you know, that workers are going through, because this is precisely what they will almost like inherit, you know, this this class struggle, this 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 workers uh, struggle. Um, learn from them, but then also vice versa, right? We can tell them about us. We can tell them about our organization and about our program and demands. And maybe they can, you know, be asking, uh, you know, the workers to come and write for our paper, for example, you know, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, so it's, it's a huge, like, you know, learning curve and experience as a student to be already drawn into the class struggle. Um, so yeah, so that's of course something that the RCP is sort of like training up students to do. Um, yeah. Anything to add, Fiona? Yeah, look, what we are aiming to do is build branches of the RCP on campus. Um, we aren't interested in building student societies for the sake of having student societies. Um, we want to build a, a branch that can actually play an active role in fighting for the ideas of, of Marxism on campus, which will involve um, the educational meetings that we've spoken about, the paying attention to theory, but also then being active when you know, strikes take place on a university mm. campus. And mm. over the last five years, there have been a lot of strikes by the UCU mm. in particular, um, which is a union that organizes a lot of academic staff on, on campus. And we've been massively involved in, in strikes, organizing student staff solidarity on, on campuses for, for a number of years. And the point about being a part of a revolutionary organization is that... You know, because look, on different universities, you will find other people, other kind of student activists who, um, you know, want to play a role in, in, you know, fighting for workers' rights and things like this. But after a couple of years, they leave. Um, and actually, universities are very aware of this. So they kind of have this approach, some of them, of we can just wait it out. We can wait mm -hmm. out this little moment of student politics because mm -hmm. in one or two years, these people, this little generation of people who've come through are going to move on. Mm -hmm. Um, that's no good because that doesn't defend the gains if gains have been won in a particular strike or a particular campaign, for example. And so that's why for us, um, as I said, we're more than just a, a student society, but we're actually building branches of, a rev of the Revolutionary Communist Party on, on campus, which is very important. Anyone can become a member of the Revolutionary Communist Party so long as they take on a class perspective. Um, and, and students, when they join, the first thing we're going to do, yeah, is, is send them to or turn them to the workers, um, take them to the picket lines on their campus, but also in the town mm -hmm. in order to broaden out their perspective on, on life. Having said that, this also comes from the fact, you know, in the past, um, students came from a much more middle class background. That is true. That's a fact. In order to go to university, you have to have a, a, a certain standard of, of living, maybe, should we say. But that is less and less the case. Um, mm -hmm. and, and students today, many of whom are workers themselves, actually, and have to work in order to sustain their, their time at uni. So it's it's not difficult uh, to convince them of the need to take on a, on a class perspective from that mm -hmm. point of view. So, yeah. Build the RCP on campus, and you'll do that by educating people in the ideas of Marxism and then showing them how to use that in the class struggle itself, which is taking place right now on your campus and in your town. Um, you've just got to open your eyes and, and look. Mm -hmm. Yeah, also another thing I was going to say is, um, yes, we have been really active with DSU strikes whenever they are happening. We were there, you know, every day whenever they were, you know, having a picket line and we would go and, of course, speak to them and stuff like that. But you can see they really appreciate that. They really appreciate students being involved and, and helping out and thinking yeah. about these conditions and, and these questions. And there was even a report like of uh, of Birmingham where the UCU has asked our students to come and, and chair and host a meeting for yeah. the UCU, right? Like because they were so impressed with 
politically what we have to say. Um, and you can see that this is this is like a real um, sort of yeah, connection that is really important because they also understand that the staff and students, as we said before, share a common interest right like to to just do away with this marketization of education with all of this underfunding with the closures of departments and layoffs which of course will in turn also affect their quality of education as well as the livelihoods you know in in of the of the staff and their families or anything like that and i yeah that is the that is the positive role basically that students can play you know in in sort of aiding the class struggle and in aiding the cause of, of the workers yet yeah, on campus, but also off campus, right? Whatever way we can. Okay, well, I think that wraps things up. Um, but one last question, I guess I can ask to either of you who wants to answer it. What can members of the RCP who are on campuses right now do immediately after they've finished listening to this podcast to prepare for the final term of the, of the university year? Yeah, look, the most important thing is that we get out there and find more communists and find more um, people to join the RCP. And we're going to do that by putting up the posters, um, the Are You a Communist posters, doing stalls, recruitment stalls, flyering, lecture shout outs, door knocking. What we need people to do is raise the flag of the RCP on campus and say, look, the communists are here. And as we've said, there's people out there who already think that there's something wrong with capitalism. What they need is the, the ideas in order to make that concrete and make their kind of you know abstract sense of I think I'm a communist into a real part of, of who they are um, and the only way to make that real is if they're a part of a communist party um, which is what we're trying to build on, on campus. Thanks very much Fiona I think we'll maybe leave it there for this episode but before you go uh, yeah just a few quick announcements so if you aren't already a member of the Revolutionary Communist Party but you agree with what we have to say on this podcast then it sounds like you're a communist, so why not get organized with us? If you head to the link in the show notes of this podcast, you'll find our application form. If you send that in, we'll get in touch with you as soon as possible, either to put you in touch with your nearest branch or your nearest cell, or if there isn't one near you, we'll give you the support and the resources that you need to try and set one up yourself. And if you're not ready to join quite yet, then why not support us in other ways? First of all, you can take out a subscription to our newspaper, The Communist, and our magazine, In Defense of Marxism, from as little as £5 per month. And the money will go towards helping finance the Revolutionary Communist Party and uh, yeah, spreading the ideas of Marxism far and wide. Uh, and, lastly, why not take a, and lastly, why not donate to the party? If you head to the show notes of this podcast, you'll find a link to our donation page. We're currently trying to raise uh, £20,000 for the, for the launch of the RCP. And we still have some way to go, so make sure you donate as much as you can and share this amongst your family, your friends, your co-workers, anyone who's sympathetic to the ideas of communism. And our founding congress is, as we've said, only less than two weeks away, I think. So if you're interested in coming along to the founding congress, we'd urge you to get in touch with us and get in touch with your nearest branch of the RCP and see if you can make it along to what promises to be a very historic event in the history of communism. So yeah, I think that's it for this episode. Thanks very much to our listeners for tuning in and make sure you stay tuned to Marxist Voice for future episodes covering Marxist theory, revolutionary history, current events and party building brought to you by the Revolutionary Communist Party. 